Hello, this is the Consciousness Podcast, and I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. In this episode, I had the honor of speaking with Dr. Albert Garcia Romeo, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins and a guest researcher at the National Institute on Drug Abuse Intramural Neuroimaging Research Branch, where he studies the effects of psychedelic drugs in humans, with a focus on psilocybin as an aid in the treatment of addiction. We discussed his work with psilocybin, what it means to be addicted, and what insight his work has given him into the mystery of consciousness. So please enjoy this episode with Dr. Garcia Romeo. I am uh, really honored to have you be here on the uh, Consciousness Podcast. Um, I know you and I had originally tried to connect at a conference a couple of years ago, and you being a presenter, uh, it was uh, difficult because you're surrounded by a bunch of people that had a million questions. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to join me here today and talk a little bit about psilocybin and psychedelics and consciousness. My pleasure, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, I remember that when we uh, almost connected out in Arizona back for that conference. But yeah, I was yeah. A, little, a little bit crazy. So I'm glad it we was, it was able to reconnect here. Yeah, yeah, me too. Thank you. Okay, so I know, uh, um, you know, what I know you're from, and I think uh, a lot of people know you about from you is the, the work you did in studying the, the treatment of addiction to tobacco, the cessation of smoking with the aid of psilocybin. So maybe I know you probably told this story a zillion times, but let me give us a little bit of background on on that study and what you did and what you learned. Yeah, my pleasure. I think that's a really fascinating and important study. Uh, I got very fortunate, which was uh, in 2012, I was wrapping up my PhD at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology over in Palo Alto, California. Uh, and I had been studying uh, mindfulness meditation and altered states of consciousness and um, how self-transcendence kind of uh, is wrapped up in a person's personality, but also uh, can you know, be a factor in their mental health. So I had some uh, overlapping interests with some of the researchers that were doing the psilocybin work here at Johns Hopkins. And I got connected with them uh, through a meeting. It was actually towards a science of consciousness uh, conference that I was at mm -hmm. in Tucson, Arizona. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I eventually got in touch with the group here and um, was interviewed and uh, accepted a postdoctoral fellowship. And so um, basically my job when I came over here, once I finished school and all that, was to finish this study. Uh, and the study was a small pilot that was conceived by Matt Johnson, who's uh, my mentor, one of my mentors here at Hopkins. I've been working with for, well, ever since, you know, since 2012. So it's been over eight years now. Um, and, you know, they came up with the idea of trying to use psilocybin in combination with some of your more kind of standard talk therapy or counseling to help people quit smoking. And um, that was considered a, mo a good model of using psychedelics to treat addiction because smoking is a little different than many other addictions or at many other substance use disorders, as we call them technically in psychiatry, uh, because uh, many smokers aren't burdened by a lot of the other psychosocial problems that come along with, say, heavy alcohol or heavy, mm. you know, opioid use, where, you know, those people could lose jobs or lose romantic partners or friends or, you know, even sometimes lose their homes, um, which ob obviously would complicate the treatment situation. Um, and so the idea was if we wanted a model of treating addiction using psychedelics, um, you know, what about looking at using psychedelics in combination with some counseling to treat smoking, uh, you know, smokers who wanted to quit. Um, and, you know, I think the other important piece here is that uh, tobacco nicotine dependence is a huge public health problem. I mean, it's really a scourge uh, in the sense that it uh, kills more people than all the other drugs put together. I mean, whether you're talking about heroin, crack cocaine, alcohol, all the other drugs we know about um, put in one pile, um, you know, tobacco actually dwarves them um, hmm. many times over in terms of the, the number of deaths uh, that are attributable to smoking. So it's a, it's a huge problem. We also don't have very good treatments uh, as of yet. There are three FDA approved treatments, including nicotine patches and some medications. Um, they work okay for some people, um, but the majority of people who use them uh, don't end up quitting in the long term on any given attempt. 
Uh, so obviously there's room for improvement there. You know, there's room for um, better treatments. And, and so it was, uh, you know, an idea that I think Matt had started this project back in 2008. Um, there wasn't a lot of dedicated, uh, you know, human power uh, to finishing that study here because they were so busy with some of the other studies that were ongoing. So when I got here, my kind of primary assignment was to uh, learn learn how to do this um, treatment protocol and then conduct it with a number of people to finish the study, crunch the numbers, and then publish the data. And indeed, we did that. Uh, and it was both one of the you know best learning experiences of my life, but also, um, you know, wonderful professional kind of stepping stone to, um, you know, moving this work forward in terms of looking at uh, psilocybin as a treatment for addiction and just really exploring psychedelics as a therapeutic. Um, so that study ended up being a, a grand total of 15 cigarette smokers uh, who on average had been smoking uh, for uh, about 20 years, I believe that was the average wow. length of smoking and about a pack a day. So, you know, these weren't your just... Um, yeah, you know your social smokers who are having a couple of cigarettes on the weekend or something. Um, you know, many of them were smoking every hour on the hour. You know, every day for for many years and had tried and had not been able to stop. Um, so it's it's you know very uh, frustrating I think for these folks when they find that to be a, you know something that they can't break away from despite their best efforts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the people who showed up, they were very motivated. Uh, this is an intensive uh, treatment uh, modality that we put together here. And so it involves um, what you call cognitive behavioral therapy, where there is some examination of the sort of thoughts and emotional landscape around the smoking behavior and how those are all wrapped up together. Uh, and, uh, you know, we use the cognitive behavioral therapy uh, before and then um, we would used a few um, doses of psilocybin using moderate and high doses um, in that uh, initial study where there were two or three administrations spread out over the course of several weeks. And then there was a, a sort of follow-up supportive counseling where people would come in and check in with us and you know provide biological samples so we could track their progress. And so overall that took about three or uh, maybe a little over than uh, three months um, to you know, go through that entire process of treatment. And then we followed up with them six and 12 months after their quit to see, you know, what's going on in the longer term. How, are, you know, how did they fare? Uh, and, you know, the sort of long and the short of it was that uh, a majority of those smokers had quit um, at the end of the treatment. Uh, so that was 80% of them or 12 out of the 15. Wow. Uh, and yeah, which is really good, good results. And I think the Probably the more important thing is that six months after uh, they had quit, they were 80% of them were still abstinent. And so that really speaks to sort of a longevity of this type of treatment that even though they only had uh, uh, one or, or, I'm sorry, two or three administrations of psilocybin, that they were continuing to sort of reap the benefits uh, for months later. Um, and we followed up with them for a year and actually um, beyond that, uh, and still finding that, uh, you know, at 12 months, uh, we had a 67% abstinence rate. Uh, and uh, around two and a half years later, on average, uh, we had people come back in and, and talk to us about their experience. And we were still uh, seeing 60% of them not smoking, um, which is um, really, wow. yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Just uh, basically looking at the available treatments, you know, you really see something like a 30 or 35% success rate at six months. And then that typically degrades over time where, you know, people relapse, things happen. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so we we're very pleased with that. And um, that spilled over into um, a follow-up study that I'm actually still conducting right now with Matt and our colleagues at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, and we're in the middle of doing an 80 person randomized control trial where half of the people are getting, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy with nicotine patches and the other half are getting cognitive behavioral therapy with psilocybin and then hmm. we're following up with all of them to see, you know, how do they do? That's amazing. So you obviously you believe in this from the results you saw and then now you're doing this follow-on study. 
What do you think it, it is about psilocybin that really makes that big of a difference between therapy with a patch and, and therapy with psilocybin? What do you, what do you think is going on there that is making this difference? You know, uh, it's hard to say. I think we've struggled to kind of give people a straight answer on that. Um, pharmacologically speaking, we know that many of the major drug effects um, from these classic psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD um, are mediated by the serotonin 2A receptor. And we know that because we can block that receptor and then give people psilocybin and they don't really feel very much. So something's happening there um, that is probably just one piece of the puzzle as we're learning more about these drugs and their biological mechanisms. You know, they have these uh, anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, they have uh, effects that disrupt brain network dynamics and functional connectivity, changing the way that the uh, different hubs of the brain are communicating between themselves. Um, and some of that has been linked to this kind of more subjective quality uh, that people sometimes talk about as ego dissolution or um, mystical type effects, um, feelings uh, that are, you know, profoundly altered sense of self, uh, changes in their thinking and emotional processes. And so hmm. whatever's happening acutely during the drug effects um, is an important piece. Um, but then there's also a sort of uh, reverberating or persisting uh, effects uh, that come afterwards that, uh, you know, specifically with uh, supportive care and wraparound treatment of the sort that we're providing um, seems to help people make these big changes in their behavior and sometimes in other domains of their lives. Hmm. Yeah. Have you, have you looked at other, I've heard of other uh, psychedelics um, helping with addiction. Like one of the big ones I keep hearing about is Ibogaine with with opioids i don't i don't know if you've looked into that at all or see any any parallels or differences or something that made you uh connect some new dots have you looked at, into that at all yeah so uh, ibogaine is a really interesting drug um it's uh, derived from a shrub in west africa uh, and it is pharmacologically really complicated it's um a bit different than many of the other classic psychedelics because it has um, well, it binds to almost every kind of receptor <laughs> you can think of, mm. um, but it, it is definitely um, binding to the opioid receptors uh, as well as the serotonin 2A receptor, as well as, you know, you name it, um, many of the different types of uh, neurotransmitter systems in the brain are affected by ibogaine. And so ibogaine has its own kind of history and lore with uh, Howard Lotsoff and you know, it's more kind of longer term historical use by uh, the Buiti people, I believe, in, in West Africa, um, who used it as part of their own cultural rights. Um, but yes, it's kind of grown this um, underground cult following of people who um, have had experience with it and attribute um, a lot of positive benefits, uh, as well as uh, specifically, you know, for overcoming addiction and particularly uh, opioid dependence has been one of the big ones. Um, mm -hmm. The National Institute on Drug Abuse had uh, funded some work in this direction um, many years ago, and it seemed very promising. But um, with Ibogaine in particular, there is a risk for cardiovascular events that could be problematic. Um, you know, and the uh, drug acute effects, you know, are quite long lasting, which um, could also make it difficult to work with in a clinical, uh, from a clinical standpoint. Um, so I haven't done any work myself. I've only read about it, but um, from what I hear, you know, there seems to be some real potential benefits there. And then, you know, some other risk factors that are slightly different from what you would uh, find with the classic psychedelics, which physiologically have a pretty high safety profile. Right. Right. Do you think you mentioned how it's interesting you chose smoking because of the difference and effect it can have on, on one's life, you know, in terms, like you said, with relationships and jobs and those kind of things, um, even though it kills so much, so many more people, do you see psilocybin though, being able to help with addictions to those other things like alcohol and gambling and, and, and those other types of addictions, given what you've seen so far? Well, you know, the data are still preliminary, but, um, you know, the information that, we have available to us right this minute would certainly suggest that this classic psychedelic, specifically psilocybin and LSD, 
but very possibly mescaline and others that we have yet to explore. Uh, certainly ayahuasca as well, which contains DMT. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all of these really seem to have a profound uh, impact on people who use them. Uh, and there is good data to suggest that it can be that they can be useful across the gamut of different types of substance use disorders. So we have a small study from Dr. Michael Bogenschutz published in, I think, 2015, um, looking at using psilocybin with uh, some counseling for uh, alcohol dependence and seeing really positive results there, reduced drinking, reduced heavy drinking. Um, You know, that's very much consistent with the the historical use of LSD in uh, research settings to treat alcoholism back in the 1960s, um, much of that work had positive uh, results as well, though, you know, there's a lot of methodological uh, limitations with some of that work just because of when it was being done and the limited understanding of these drugs back in the, back in those days. Um, you know, the, yeah. the stuff with ayahuasca and, um, you know, treating addictions is still uh, more anecdotal or more observational in nature, but um, you know, the signal is there in terms of seeing people who have had ayahuasca experiences that attribute great benefit in terms of overcoming addiction. And uh, even my friend, uh, P- uh, Dr. Peter Hendricks, who's at University of Alabama, Birmingham, is um, you know, in the middle of a study using psilocybin uh, to treat cocaine dependence, which is a notoriously <laughs> difficult uh, drug uh, dependence to treat and is finding some really, really uh, promising results. So, you know, based on all that and, you know, based on the historical literature like Savage and McCabe, which is a study that was done here in Baltimore and published in 1973 uh, using uh, high-dose LSD treatment for um, men who were formerly incarcerated. So when they're getting out of um, incarceration and who had previously had uh, opioid dependence and really seeing a dramatic decrease in their relapse rates as opposed to some of the other men in the control group who didn't get the LSD uh, treatment. You know, all of that data squarely points to these classic psychedelics um, having a significant therapeutic potential for treating addictions of all sorts uh, for these substance use disorders. Um, Now, the other thing you mentioned, you said gambling, and, you know, we would think of that more along the lines of like a maybe a behavioral addiction or something like gambling hmm. or um, shopping. Sometimes people talk about things like um, yeah. or sex addiction. Um, you know, I don't know that it's been systematically studied, uh, but to me, it makes sense that, um, you know, many of the uh, psychological and potentially biological processes that are going on in those cases are uh, quite similar to what you see in these substance use disorders and thereby uh, that the classic psychedelics could be a very feasible treatment option, um, particularly with the, you know, combined with a good therapy. Okay. Also, I noticed in your, in your presentation, you had a slide about the methodology for actually administering a dose that you do it based on either, I, I forget what you called it, like a flat rate to say we're gonna give everybody the same dose or we're gonna do it based on body weight which which of the two do you think, or which one did you use in your studies? And I uh, assume that that would be the one you would say is more more accurate. That's a funny uh, story, actually. Um, you know, the work that's been done at Hopkins and at many of the labs around the world um, since the 90s have tended to use this weight-adjusted dosing um, as a matter of convention. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, basically the idea is I'm a big guy, I'm 280 pounds. And, uh, you know, if you had my wife who weighs less than half than I do, um, you know, kind of intuitively, you would think, well, this big guy needs a, a big dose of psilocybin. And, you know, this uh, much smaller woman probably doesn't need quite as much to have the same effect. And so, you know, the weight adjusted dosing has just been the way uh, that much of this research has been conducted um, for, for some time. Um, I recently uh, submitted a paper and it's under review right now at the Journal of Psychopharmacology. So we hope that that will be published um, not too long from now, but we actually pulled the data from, I don't know, I think it must've been seven or eight of the studies that we conducted here 
um, from cigarette smokers and healthy volunteers and and uh, cancer patients. So all the people that we had administered psilocybin to in the last 19 or so years here and looked at whether the drug effects, you know, their acute effects, um, intensity and mystical and challenging effects um, were in any way related to their body weight or their BMI. And, hmm. you know, looking at that big pooled analysis, it really looks like there is variability in the person's response to the drug, but it's not predicated on their body weight. Uh, and so there are other factors that will determine how a person responds to psilocybin. So, you know, two people might need a different dose to have similar effects, but it doesn't seem to be that body weight uh, being the kind of the major factor there. And so what you're seeing now is a lot of the bigger scale research that's happening um, as we move towards these FDA approved, uh, well, hopefully these trials to you know, move us towards FDA approval um, are using a flat uh, or fixed dose. Hmm. Meaning that uh, everybody, regardless of your body weight, is going to get the same amount. And from the information we have available, it seems as though that should be equally as effective if, uh, as the weight adjusted dosing. And, you know, from a logistics standpoint, it's much easier to do that if you just manufacture 25 milligram capsules and give everybody the same capsule, as opposed to what we've been doing for the last 20 years, which is, um, you know, this guy gets X milligrams yeah. because he weighs this much. And, and that next person gets that much because of how much they weigh. Interesting. Yeah. And I felt like, and maybe, maybe I read the graphs wrong, but I also felt like one's reaction, mystical experience or heart experience also didn't really depend on the dose. Or maybe that's kind of the, the other side of what you're telling me right now is it doesn't depend on the body weight so much, but it also doesn't depend on the dose that people at all dose ranges, people could have a mystical experience or a bad experience. So I think it's really more about the weight not being a factor mm. there. Because what we we're seeing is, um, and uh, Roland Griffiths, who I work with here, did a really nice study, um, these within subject trials. You know, um, what happens is you get a bunch of people and they come back on multiple days and it's the same person and they have a bunch of different doses. And that way you can see within that person who's the same weight and the same uh, individual each time, you know, how these different doses impact a person. And they used five doses in that study and found that you're more likely to get mystical type effects and challenging effects with the higher doses, specifically mm -hmm. in that 30 milligram per 70 kilogram dose range. Um, and you still get some mystical experiences and less challenging experiences in the moderate dose, which is about 20 milligrams per 70 kilograms. Um, but when I pulled all these data and I took a look at that, um, yeah, what we were looking at really seemed to suggest that if you give a bunch of people 25 milligrams, for instance, regardless of their weight, some of them are going to have mystical type effects and some of them won't. Some of them will have challenging effects, some of them won't. Um, and the body weight is not a, a highly correlated factor with the subjective effects. So we know kind of if you push it past a certain dose, then you're going to be more likely to get those mystical or challenging effects. But in terms of the individual variability in that, um, the body weight doesn't seem to be playing a huge role. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned the mystical effects, challenging effects. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, ego dissolution. When, when you brought your, your uh, smokers back and you talked to them at six months, 12 months, and now you're talking to them at a year or two later, um, did you notice, did they report back or did you ask any other changes in their lives? You know, so if they had this mystical experience that they come back and say, oh, this is, the other things have improved in my life, not just, you know, quitting smoking, but I have all this other stuff going on. Were there any, I, I guess, kind of like positive side effects? I hate to put it that way, like some kind of a commercial, but is it, was there other things that were going on in their lives that, that they thought maybe were a part or a side effect of the whole experience? Yes. And uh, that was a very common thing that we heard from people because, you know, we're so honed in on the smoking that, 
we were always asking people, you know, have you been smoking? Have you had any cigarettes? Have you had any craving to smoke? Um, and for some of these people, as you said, it's been years since they had had any cigarettes. And so you say, you know, yeah, I've, I've stopped smoking and it's behind me now. Um, but that doesn't really seem that important anymore. And let me tell you what else happened. And beyond smoking, there's all this other stuff. And so, and this is a quote from a participant in one of our papers that we published. Uh, he said, this is about a smoking study. I keep forgetting that because there's so much more that happened. Smoking just seems so petty compared to some of the stuff that was happening. And so, you know, people really, I think, get beyond the smoking and um, get away from it in this type of uh, intervention that we had put together. But there's uh, pretty consistent evidence pointing to these other benefits, these other persisting effects uh, that tend to fall on the positive end of the spectrum. So things like um, increased aesthetic appreciation, um, you know, feeling like they have a, a enhanced appreciation for nature and natural beauty, um, you know, uh, increased altruism and pro-social effects where people um, feel like it's important for them to get out and help other people. Um, one lady specifically, I remember, said that, um, you know, she had been active and volunteering um, for, uh, you know, much of her life, but that she kind of threw herself more so into that type of work afterwards because she felt more motivated to do that type of thing. Um, and similarly, that it had awakened um, some of her interests, you know, from many years ago, like uh, buying books of poetry, hmm. um, types of things that, you know, um, she may have uh, long ago found very important, but may, might have kind of faded out of her consciousness and kind of came back um, after the session. Uh, so you see those types of things, um, you know, reflected in people talking about their their changes in the way that they think, the way that they feel, and the way that they relate to other people, which I think can be really helpful um, for sometimes overcoming negative patterns in some of our close relationships, like our uh, relationship with friends and family. Yeah, and I imagine that would help um, maybe not trigger some of the things that would want to make you pick up a cigarette. Ideally, yeah, that would be great. And, you know, there can be, I think, a positive feedback loop there where stopping smoking can help improve relationships, but also improving relationships can also help stay absent. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Now, you already mentioned we talked about other other uh, psychedelics like LSD and ayahuasca. I noticed that you've got some papers you're working on currently or just recently published on uh, Kratom. Kratom, I don't know how you pronounce that, but um, did you want to, talk about any of those at all? You know, I'm happy to talk about it. I just actually did a, a event to this morning, a lecture on Kratom and uh, for the American Kratom Association. And hmm. uh, it's a really interesting substance. Um, you know, I think in general, uh, I've gotten exposed through my very fortunate landing here at the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit. You know, to, I work with uh, some of the, the top uh, scientists in the field who study uh, drugs and behavior. And, um, you know, I've gotten quite immersed in psychopharmacology. And so mm -hmm. it's been something that's now kind of open and broad in my horizons. Uh, although I'm finding psychedelics, of course, very fascinating. Um, there are so many different types of drugs. And, um, you know, particularly as we focus in on things like um, addiction or uh, other related problems, then you know, you start to just perk your ears up and see what's going on in the field. And, you know, this was one of these interesting developments that I, I don't even remember how I got interested or involved in this work, but, um, you know, it came into my awareness that there were people who were using this, this plant, which is indigenous to Southeast Asia. It's called the uh, Metragena speciosa. Um, it's uh, related to coffee, actually. Huh. And um, it's got these big big, pretty leaves that um, in them, uh, they have all these different alkaloids, um, over 40 different types of alkaloids. Um, and I should note psilocybin is an alkaloid uh, that's naturally occurring in fungi. And then, you know, caffeine is an alkaloid that's naturally occurring in, um, you know, in coffee plants. And so uh, kratom has these alkaloids like uh, metragenine and 7-hydroxymetragenine um, that 
occur in the leaves and you know um, the people in Southeast Asia have used the plant uh, you know as part of their culture for um, you know for many years and they uh, tend to either um, ground the leaves up and make a tea out of it or um, you know use it uh, as a sort of uh, um, work uh, well they use it in a way sometimes like coffee so uh, you use it to kind of help you get through your work day sometimes mm-hmm. for social uh, you know socializing sort of like we might use alcohol at a happy hour um, but pharmacologically the the drug itself the plant is so interesting because it has properties that make it seem uh, similar to a lot of opioids um, but um, from a chemical standpoint, uh, metragenine and those alkaloids in the kratom plant are distinct and they're not the same as all the naturally occurring opioids that we know of, which come from a different class of plants, from the uh, popover somniferous, uh, the opium poppy, basically. And so um, opium has, uh, you know, its own opioids that come from there. And then kratom has this whole other class of different opioids that have this, their own pharmacological properties that we're really just starting to scratch the surface and understand. Um, hmm. And, you know, the reason that I got interested in, and excited about Kratom was because in the midst of this um, terrible opioid uh, crisis that we've been facing over the last decade or more, um, there were people coming out and saying, hey, you know, I've been using this plant, which I can get on the internet Um, from Asia, and it has really been helpful in getting me off of some of these more harmful prescription medications like Oxycontin, for instance, uh, that has horrible side effects, or that is, you know, really giving me a hard time in terms of my day-to-day functioning. Um, And even beyond that, you know, you had people saying, hey, I was hooked on heroin, uh, and I was using Kratom to help me get off of that and to help deal with the very severe and difficult withdrawal that people sometimes go through. Um, So, you know, when you hear that and your ears perk up and you say, wow, this is an important public health problem. And, um, you know, this is also a naturally occurring substance that um, potentially could have a lot of uh, benefit for a lot of people. And so that was really kind of where we, um, where I got interested in that and was lucky to work with mentors like Kelly Dunn and uh, other colleagues here at Hopkins and uh, Jack Henningfield and, you know, s- start to get into that world. And, um, you know, we've been just trying to keep an eye on how people are using it and also the regulatory um, piece of the puzzle, which is that, you know, DEA and FDA um, are concerned about use of this uh, substance, which has been more or less unregulated. You know, it's just buy it off the internet and it's not illegal. Um, and so they had kicked around the idea of putting it on Schedule 1, which is the most restrictive class of drugs, and which is where psilocybin is. And so, you know, knowing how difficult it is to uh, study Schedule 1 drugs uh, and having heard from all these people who were really talking about a number of good effects that they were having from using Kratom, you know, I thought it was not such a good idea. And so it's been something, uh, you know, that that uh, I've been involved with is just trying to uh, – understand how that that drug is being used, how it works, um, and how we can maybe apply some of the science to uh, get a better feel for its pharmacology and its therapeutic potentials. Uh, So, you know, how can we use that that plant to help people? Yeah, it sounds like it's got a lot of potential. It, It sounds like it really does. And again, from a pharmacological standpoint, it's just intriguing. You know, there's just, like I said, all these different um, alkaloids in there. We don't really know what they they do um, or how they work, but we're ge- we're starting to piece it apart now. And um, you know, it's I think to be continued. But um, yeah, I definitely don't think putting on schedule one would be helpful um, because it's got, it seems to have a lot of potential. Yeah, yeah. Um, earlier, you mentioned the the Science of Consciousness Convention conference. And uh, I, I attended that a couple of years ago. This one ended up being virtual. So I, I attended it virtually. Um, and there's been, you know, a few people there, uh, Selene Adesoy, that, you know, is one of them who have studied psychedelics and consciousness. And since this is the consciousness podcast, I figured I'd better ask you a couple of questions about consciousness. And sometimes I end up talking to people who 
don't necessarily work directly in the field, but they end up observing non-ordinary states of consciousness or other aspects of consciousness just as a as a result of their work. You know, like somebody who studies near-death experiences and they, they just see different things happening. But I wondered if you, you know, through the years and in, in, in observing this and studying this have had any kind of an insight in, into consciousness and, and what it might be. I know, I think on even on your bio, biography, it mentions consciousness and, and studying the underlying neurobiological mechanisms of it. So what are your thoughts on that? Are there, are there neurobiological mechanisms of consciousness? What do you think human consciousness is? Is it tied to the brain? Is it the brain? You know, what are your thoughts on it? You know, and I um, would say I'm certainly no expert on consciousness uh, from a scientific standpoint. I think I'm, you know, just like everybody else, an expert on the type of consciousness that we all walk around in all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the, I think part of what, you know, has been sometimes termed the hard problem is, is really understanding where is that intersection, I guess, between what's happening in the brain and in the body physiologically, biologically, and um, what's happening in the mind and in first person experience. And so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. It's one that I think I've really wrestled with and struggled with for some time. And um, I've gotten away from even using the term uh, outside of altered states of consciousness, because I do think that that is good and reflective of, of what happens when people take some of these substances. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, I think the problem with um, the scientific study of consciousness is that a lot of times it seems like people narrow in and you know, it's very common in academia to um, have this sort of uh, specialization as you go further and further, you get more and more focused in on the specific, you know, phenomena. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually people can, for instance, become very much tied to a particular definition of consciousness. And this is what consciousness is. And if that's what yeah. it is, then this is how it me can be measured. Um, but then when you kind of narrow it down so much, then I think you might end up losing some of the bigger picture. And it's kind of like talking about, you know, measuring beauty or defining or describing that, you know, it's um, this phenomena that uh, I think in many ways defies this exact uh, scientific terminology and definition. And, and so it can be difficult to talk about it as a scientist in a way that is, uh, credible without, again, losing track of, I think, what every, you know, kind of uh, person on the street might think of as being related to their actual consciousness, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the hard question is a hard question to to address. And yeah. uh, as a scientist, it's, it's almost uh, part of you says, yeah, I almost don't even want to address it because it's, it's almost uh, not knowable. Well, there, you know, there seems to be things that are perhaps beyond what we're able to understand or define properly at this time. And maybe that mm -hmm. will change as we learn more. Um, you know, I'm, I've been fascinated. I think when I was an undergraduate and when I moved through graduate school, I was very, very much uh, fascinated with the brain and uh, the neurobiology and how that uh, correlated with consciousness, if you will. Mm hmm and, you know, we still do research on that, and I think it's important. Um, but as I've kind of done more work in the field and I've read more, and, uh, you know, I've gotten to a point where I think that we're only going to be able to learn so much from the brain um, and from biology uh, in terms of consciousness, because I think um, consciousness, uh, you know, in some ways goes beyond the brain. And so I think that Yes, it's couched in the brain, but uh, looking for consciousness in the brain is kind of like uh, you know looking for the weatherman inside a television. Um, you know, right. Um, I think there's there's very important stuff happening in the brain, and without that, we may not have consciousness. Um, but then, you know, there's other stuff going on, and I think there's emergent properties from the level of complexity that we see in the human brain and in other uh, organisms uh, in terms of you know, cellular and molecular and electrophysiological and neurochemical, uh, you know, 
activity that is working together in concert to create um, this first person experience that, that you know, you and I are living in. Um, but then we kind of get to this wall of, you know, not being able to go much deeper or further um, because, you know, whatever's happening in your consciousness right now and whatever's happening in mine are kind of, you know, we're the only ones who are privy to that. And, you know, I can ask you, Stuart, what's happening? But, and you can tell me, but I don't know if it's true. And um, yeah, it's, yeah. So we, we start to run into some problems there, um, you know, in terms of direct empirical observation, um, particularly some that can be kind of looked at from a third person or outside perspective. Yeah, you run, you run on that. What's like asking what happened before the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. Did you get to that point of, well, how would I know? And I, I can't look at you and say, Al, are you conscious? I mean, you seem conscious to me, but I can't really know that for sure, can I? Exactly. I think, you know, we hit some limits, some epistemological limits, perhaps, um, around talking about and understanding consciousness. Um, but what I can say, you know, with respect to our work with psychedelics and consciousness is that um, I've been struck by the nature of experiences that people have, um, many of whom describe very similar types of experiences when they have these high dose psychedelic or high dose psilocybin sessions in specific. And, you know, it makes me wonder about um, whether there's some sort of biological substrate um, that we're hardwired to have these types of experiences. If so, why? Or, or maybe it's just random chance. Um, though, you know, that also seems questionable because um, the types of experiences that I've seen uh, often tend to be very beneficial and, and very um, positive and in a way uh, help a person grow and develop uh, towards their best possible self. And so that, you know, really gives me a sense that you know, there may be some kind of intelligent design involved. I mean, it, hmm. you know, it begs the question anyways of, of what these experiences, you know, if somebody designed them and what they were designed for and, and why we would we be, um, you know, hardwired to have them um, right. either with or without drugs. And, you know, people have reported mystical or unity, unitive experiences uh, throughout history. Um, but if these substances like psilocybin or ayahuasca, you know, can help unlock these types of experiences, um, then, you know, I think it just adds to this fascinating mystery of, of, you know, what we're all doing here and why, and, and, you know, what's, uh, what is the sort of, uh, kind of big picture here around, um, our little consciousnesses that are all running around and, um, if there is this bigger consciousness um, that uh, might kind of be beyond what we're able to grasp. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, all right. Well, we're getting to the end here. What, what have I not asked you? What, what else did you want to get out there and, and, and talk about in terms of your, your studies or your thoughts or whatever? You know, um, I'm just really pleased to see the field moving forward right now. Uh, and it's, getting a lot of uh, interest from a lot of different perspectives, some of which I think is very positive. Um, you know, we've been able to found uh, and start last year uh, the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, which is a huge step forward for us, um, thanks to generous philanthropic support from uh, the Stephen and Alexander Cohen Foundation and Tim Ferriss and his colleagues who were so generous to help us, um, you know, get that off the ground. And I think as we see other, uh, you know, centers and, you know, more work kind of coming to the fore here, um, it's a really exciting time uh, to be involved in this. And I think it could potentially lead to a transformation of what we think of as uh, mental health care. And perhaps in some way it could, um, you know, help bring some level of, uh, I don't know if you want to say spirituality, but at least holistic thinking to um, mm. the way that we see ourselves and our interconnectedness with the world that I think could be very important for the survival of the species as we kind of enter these very difficult um, ecologic and environmental concerns that are happening right now from 
uh, climate change to, you know, pollution and, and so forth. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think the psychedelics that we're studying um, could have a really big role to play in a lot of that stuff. Um, and, you know, on the flip side of that coin, I'm also a little bit concerned, you know, coming from uh, an academic setting where, you know, whoever qualifies for our studies, we give these, you know, we're happy to, you know, admit, enroll, and then give these interventions to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, my job, and I, and I love that. Um, but also be, being in the United States and uh, being somewhat familiar with the sort of for-profit healthcare system and the big pharmaceutical industries and, um, you know, a capitalist framework, um, it strikes me as concerning that um, if that kind of capitalist for-profit thinking kind of subsumes some of the work that's happening here at Hopkins and elsewhere with psychedelics uh, as mental health treatments or even as, um, you know, tools for self-exploration or whatever you want to, you know, think of it as, um, it could really potentially do damage um, and um, make this so that it's not equitably available. Um, And, you know, I think this is true for a lot of things, you know, um, you know, if you have a cancer, for instance, and you're dealing with that, if you can't pay for the treatment, then, you know, that's kind of where you're at. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it pains me to think that something like psilocybin, which grows out of the ground, um, you know, would not be available to someone because of lack of resources or that there are a lot of these, uh, you know, companies springing up that are seemingly working to really enrich themselves um, using this, you know, these models of, of healing and uh, potentially to the detriment of, of some people and you know, in a way that would make it difficult for you know, already disenfranchised people to, to have access. So that's mm-hmm. really important to me. And that's, you know, I think it's important to think about, and particularly because um, many of these substances have been used by indigenous cultures for long before Western medicine started um, exploring them. So, you know, it just seems like it could be extractive without um, being re- reciprocal, meaning that, that we're taking from cer- certain communities who are already uh, hurting and we might not be offering anything in return. I think that's a problem. That's a good point. That's an excellent point. Um, um, yeah. Did you have more? No, I was going to say, other than that, you know, I, I uh, would just say that for people who want to uh, keep up with our work, we have a lot of exciting stuff going on. You know, our lab website is uh, hopkinspsychedelic.org. And, you know, we have studies uh, of psilocybin in people with anorexia nervosa, uh, with major depression, uh, with alcohol use disorder, with, um, you know, cigarette smokers who are trying to quit, um, early stage Alzheimer's disorder, uh, disease. Um, so all of these different uh, studies are kind of up and running or getting the ball rolling uh, after COVID right now. And so it's uh, something that you can keep up with. And particularly if you're near Maryland, uh, uh, you know, you may be able to participate. Um, and, you know, one other study that we have there at the website is a study we're doing in collaboration with Unlimited Sciences, uh, which is a nonprofit that sponsored a large scale survey study that we're doing right now for people who are using psilocybin outside of the, the lab setting. So, you know, out in the real world. Uh, mm. and yeah, yeah, we're trying to just get data from a lot of people to see what happens when they use uh, psilocybin out there. And um, if there are things that help predict a good or bad experience. Um, so, you know, we can have a better sense for what is and is not a good idea in these uh, therapeutic settings. And um, yeah, we are currently have something like 3000 people enrolled and we're hoping to get more, um, but that's something that you can find also uh, by going to our website, hopkinspsychedelic.org or unlimited sciences. And um, you know, it just involves filling out a series of surveys before and after using psilocybin. So we can track kind of progress over time. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I will put a link to that. So anybody listening that wants to participate, they can they can go there and participate, right? Yep, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Al, thank you so much for all that. I really appreciate all the great information and uh, spending time talking a little bit about consciousness, you know, on there. I know that's a sticky subject. So I really appreciate your time and your generosity. And thank you for all the great info. My pleasure, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, 
yeah, look forward to hearing the next episode. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast at our Twitter handle at ConchCast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.